Grace, the the Grand Stevens case is, uh, without a doubt, one of my favorite stories. Um, you know, there's all these aspects to it. You have uh, abduction. You have uh, mental messages. You have an encounter with beings. You have uh, men in black type characters. You have uh, a doctor who's so frightened that he actually burns his notes. These things, it's just, it's just a really strange case, and it's actually uh, kind of frightening. David Stevens, 21, and Glenn Gray, 18, were people of the night. Both worked the night shift, Stevens in a poultry processing plant, Gray at a wool mill. It was Sunday, October 26, 1975, and they were just ending their weekend off from work, hoping to sleep through the next day and be awake and alert for the next night shift. They decided to toil away the evening listening to records in their trailer in Norway, Maine, a town seven miles northwest of Oxford. Their night of rowdy fun was disrupted around 2.30 a.m. when they heard what sounded like a loud explosion in the woods just outside their trailer. They cautiously ventured into the night, looking to see what caused the ruckus. To their surprise, they found nothing. Assuming it to be a firecracker, they shrugged it off and headed back inside to their music. They eventually grew bored and decided to turn off the music and go for a quick joyride in Gray's 68 Plymouth. They intended it to be a short trip, a drive south on Route 26 past the home of Stephen's parents and then over to Lake Thompson, just south of the village of Oxford. As they set off on their journey, something very strange happened. Their intended short jaunt around the lake would turn into a night of terror they would never forget. About a mile down the road, Gray, the driver, suddenly lost control. He had a firm grip on the wheel, but no matter what he did or how hard he stomped the brakes, he simply could not stop or control the vehicle after a certain point. To him, it was as if somebody else had taken control of it. Whomever or whatever abruptly steered them onto a back road heading directly into the town of Oxford. The road was known for being bumpy and twisting, but Stevens noted that it was a smooth ride with virtually no noticeable bumps and the winding stretches seemed to be maneuvered without trouble. The two men began to sense that the vehicle may have been elevated off the road to some extent and gliding along at what they estimated to be a brisk 100 miles an hour. After what seemed to be only two or three minutes, they found themselves passing through Oxford and onto the West Poland Road some eight miles from Norway. Under ordinary circumstances, the trip over the rugged five-mile stretch of road would have taken them from seven to ten minutes, but this trip was far from ordinary. A couple miles south of Oxford, Stevens and Gray looked out their car window and saw a herd of cows sitting in a nearby field. Something was wrong, though. These cows were behaving oddly, shaking their heads from side to side as if agitated or frightened by something. Suddenly, they looked to their left and saw two white lights shining across the expanse of cornfield. At first they thought it was a truck or something, like some kids goofing off in a field. Then the thing raised up above the trees. Then they thought it was a helicopter. Gray, who suddenly noticed that he had control of the vehicle again, stopped the car and turned off the engine. Assuming it to be nothing more than a conventional aircraft, he and Stevens let out a sigh of relief. They rolled down the windows in the car and listened for the familiar sound of a helicopter engine, but there was no sound. We couldn't hear anything, Stevens said. The men immediately became frightened, but before they could do anything, the two lights in the field suddenly turned off. When they went out, two big bright lights hit us in the eyes, Stevens said. Apparently, in very short time, the object moved across the field and swerved down not far from where the two men were parked in the road. For the first time, they got a clear look at it and realized that it was nothing they'd seen before. Twenty to thirty feet from their car, a long, cylinder-shaped, massive object sat hovering above the trees. 
Stevens described it as being the size of a football field, just a massive object. Around its body were assorted green, blue, and yellow lights. As the mysterious craft descended below a row of trees in front of the field, the lights turned off. The two men were terrified. Let's get out of here, Stephen screamed. Gray was already turning over the engine. They rolled up the windows, locked the doors, and got the heck out of there. As they made their way toward the village of Poland, the object began tailing them. This thing started following us, only it was just in front of us and up above us a little. We went a half a mile to a mile and suddenly those two lights went out. At the same time, this really big bright light hit us in the eyes. That's when we blacked out. When Stevens and Greg came to, they were a mile farther down the road. The car was stopped, the doors were unlocked, and their windows were rolled down. They were in a great deal of discomfort, and they felt as though their eyes were on fire. They suspected that they had been out for five minutes. In reality, it was much longer. The UFO was still visible in the eastern sky. They eventually got the car going and drove into nearby West Poland. Along the way, they lost sight of the object. Thinking it was all over, the two men turned around and headed back down the road from where they had just come down towards Oxford. Even though they were relieved that the UFO had disappeared, about two miles into their trip, Stevens became frightened at the prospect of driving through the darkness, fearing what might be lurking around the next bend, and he suggested that they head back to West Poland and waited out there until morning. Gray agreed. Turning their vehicle around in the road, the pair once again found themselves not in control of their car. This time the vehicle turned off a gravel road leading to Trip Pond, located on the southern part of Lake Thompson. The car engine suddenly stalled and the radio faded out. The cylinder-like UFO they saw earlier was there waiting for them, this time sitting three to four hundred feet above their car. They watched as the object moved to a new position some 500 yards away. For the next 45 minutes, the two terrified men sat inside their locked car, too frightened to exit it and unable to get it started. Suddenly, two smaller, disc-shaped objects with colored lights appeared about a quarter of a mile down the hill from them. They rose up into the sky and then gently flip-flopped back down toward the lake like falling leaves. Then they rose again as if they were climbing stair steps. After cavorting in the sky briefly, the objects then skimmed across the water towards them. They seemed to release a thick fog which engulfed their vehicle. Gray and Stevens found what happened next to be deeply unsettling, as if their sense of depth and proportion had become immediately skewed. Even though they were a half a mile from the pond, it seemed to be no more than two dozen feet from them. Not only that, but at one point, it seemed to stretch out in front of them for hundreds of miles. In reality, the pond is quite small, and the hills and forest on its opposing side are clearly visible. Even stranger, in the middle of this suddenly created ocean sat an island, over which one of the UFOs hovered ominously. The fact that Trip Pond has no such island, it makes you wonder what exactly Grant Stevens were looking at. Uh, completely in a daze, their car was, you know, they wouldn't start they were basically stuck inside their car because they were they were too afraid to uh, they were too afraid to exit the vehicle so they sat all they could do is sit and watch you know what was transpiring in front of them and essentially this mothership that was hovering above them it, it released two smaller objects I, I guess uh, it released two smaller objects and they started doing these like aerial tricks just like the buff ledge case and uh, eventually they came uh, towards the two men who were inside the car, you know, too scared to get out and leave and, or run into the woods, of course. And uh, they, there was a mist that came over them. Uh, whatever these objects were, they released a, like a fog. And when, they, when the fog uh, came over them, they were in a daze. Everything seemed completely, uh, their sense of perception was just, skewed they, they everything looked different they were about a mile from the lake and yet they said it looked like you know a couple dozen steps away and uh, the lake itself which is fairly small and if you stand on the edge of it you can actually see to the other side you can see the you know the trees on the other side and uh, they said the lake looked like an ocean it was just went on for miles and miles and miles
everything was screwed up. Um, Jenny Randall, she's an author, she describes it as, a, as the Oz effect, where in some abduction accounts, people describe how everything feels strange, everything feels off, nothing feels normal. Uh, that's what it. That's what they described essentially. And then uh, what happened was, they saw something in the middle of this, of Trip Pond. To them, it was just a giant ocean. They saw something in the middle of it, like an island. And there was a UFO hovering over this island. Uh, Trip Lake, uh, Trip Pond uh, doesn't have an island. So whatever this was, um, who you know, we can you can only uh, guess. Engulfed in the thick fog, the two men suddenly bolted upright in their car seats as their vehicle's radio blared to life. Above them, they could see the massive football field-sized object. Then all three objects went straight up into the sky and vanished, taking the thick fog with them. They estimated 15 or 20 minutes had passed since getting to Trip Pond. Dawn was breaking at this point, and the two frightened, dazed, sleepy men decided to head for Stephen's parents' house several miles away. As they drove, both men heard a voice in their head. It left them with an ominous message. We're not done with you yet. We're coming back for you. Arriving at Stephen's parents' house, the two men realized that, to their shock, it was nearly 6.30 a.m. Almost four hours had passed since leaving their trailer. Fearing that people would think they were nuts, they agreed not to share their story with anyone. Even though they didn't say anything to anyone, they couldn't hide the physiological effects of the experience. About a half an hour after they got home, they both started to feel sick. Their hands and feet were swollen, their teeth were loose, red rings appeared around their necks, and they had terrible chills. Not even two layers of coats and pants could warm them. I felt like I couldn't walk, see straight, or could hardly talk. It felt like we were in a daze, Stevens recalled. About 5 o'clock that afternoon, the two men came to the agreement that what had happened to them was too important to stay quiet about, and they called the Sheriff's Department in Oxford. County Sheriff's Deputy Eldon Bartlett, then 28, went to the Stevens' home. He was extremely skeptical. They were standing outside when Bartlett took their report. He was more than a little incredulous as they told him of encountering three UFOs and of about how they were nearly forced off the road. While he doubted their story, he couldn't deny that they seemed very scared. Whatever they had encountered some eight or nine hours earlier, it had clearly traumatized them. At one point, the deputy recalled three lights becoming visible in the sky, and Grant Stevens began to act very excited and nervous. Bartlett could see the lights. The two men claimed that they were moving, but Bartlett didn't see it. I couldn't see them moving myself. They seemed to think that they were the same ones they'd seen earlier, they were very scared, Bartlett said. Ronald Kugel, assistant principal of Oxford Hills High School and chief of police for the town of Oxford, also visited the Stevens' home that evening. He recalled the men's fright of the three stars in the sky and how they'd gotten worked up thinking they were watching them. At one point, the men asked Kugel to escort them to the hospital so they could get checked for radiation exposure. Kugel acknowledged their fear but declined to follow them. Stevens went to the hospital and was essentially mocked by the attendees. He left without getting the test done. However, later in the evening on October 28, Benjamin Twitchell, a retired military officer who was a civil defense director for Oxford County, arrived at the Stevens home to check the young men out. Apparently, the folks at the hospital felt bad and decided to call Twitchell about checking in on the men, if only to ease their minds and the minds of their parents. Twitchell agreed. He checked out their clothes, their shoes, their car, and the men themselves. Also on October 28, Brent Rains of Hollowell, Maine, went to Oxford to investigate the incident at the request of the Center for UFO Studies in Chicago. The center had been notified of the UFO sighting by the Sheriff's Office in neighboring Androscoggin County, where the village of Poland is located. Rains would also interview them on November 1 and November 11. Rains recalled that they were upset and excited as they told him their terrifying story. He spoke to David first and then, about a half an hour later, Glenn entered the conversation. He found their stories were consistent. He also noticed their obvious agitation. 
From what they told me, the various unusual factors, the disorientation in time and place, and judging from their upset nature, I was quite sure something did happen that was unusual. They told me they didn't know if they could take it. They were very excited and upset and were having chills. Gray and Stevens were desperate for someone to explain to them what happened. Reigns attempted to calm them and assure them that it was all right. They had even asked Reigns about moving. They spoke specifically about moving to a big city, possibly Oklahoma. Reigns didn't think it would do any good. They were seeing things like cubes and balls moving in the air that really weren't there and they knew they weren't there. They thought they might be going crazy, Reigns said. Later that night, he drove with them to the sites where the events had happened. At the first site, the cornfield, the men actually exited the vehicle and ventured out into the field. However, when they drove up to Trip Pond, where they claimed to have seen the mothership and the two smaller objects, they refused to get out of the car. Reigns recalled that they had chills and creepy feelings and were too frightened to leave the automobile. Given the men's outright terror and the certain absence of memory, Reigns suggested hypnosis. Shirley Fickett of Portland, Maine, a UFO investigator associated with the International UFO Bureau, also investigated and noted that the story they told was identical to Reigns' notes. It was through Fickett that hypnosis sessions were arranged with Dr. Herbert Hopkins of Old Orchard Beach, Maine. She and Dr. Hopkins met through mutual friends, and when she learned that he used hypnotism in his medical practice, she told him of the case. He agreed to help. Stevens, the older of the two, was more willing and was chosen by Hopkins to undergo hypnotic regression. Stevens had served in the Navy for four years as a machinist mate aboard an aircraft carrier and seemed more open to confronting the situation, something Gray clearly wasn't. The sessions began December 2 and continued through January with a three-week break over the holidays. They were conducted in Dr. Hopkins' office in his home in Old Orchard Beach. At least three witnesses were present at all sessions. Stevens' parents, Jean and Beatrice, Fickett, Glenn Gray sat in on the first session but was too disturbed to attend any more. Not long after the session started, Gray packed his belongings and moved to Oklahoma. Dr. Hopkins, then 56, was a graduate of the University of Illinois Medical School in Chicago. He was a general practitioner and allergist and said he'd been using hypnotism in his practice for 15 years, usually as an aid to painless childbirth for habit control, control of neurosis, nervous disorders, building confidence, etc. This was something different though. Hopkins found David to be frank, straightforward and honest. He was shy but not evasive. There is absolutely no question in my mind. The young Stevens is telling the truth, Dr. Hopkins said. When asked if he found any indication of drug use by Stevens, Dr. Hopkins said, no, none whatsoever. I'd say he's a good, clean living boy. As the sessions continued, a truly frightening abduction story began to unravel, one with terrifying implications, and one that would forever change the lives of not only the two men involved, but Dr. Hopkins as well. Stevens remembered observing the football field-sized craft rise up and shine a blinding beam of light in their direction. As the light hit them, the car skidded sideways 15 feet and they blacked out. After that, he found himself aboard the craft looking out a window. He remembered looking down at the car he had been sitting in. When that bright light came on, I wasn't in the car. I was standing in a room, a metal room, and I was looking out a window at the car. It was still skidding sideways and Glenn was in the car, still sitting in the driver's seat. Just then a strange creature entered the room. Stephen sketched it for Hopkins. He stood about four and a half feet tall, and his head was shaped like a mushroom. His skin was very pale and white, like he hadn't been in the sun for years. He didn't have any hair or eyebrows. His eyes were large and slanted and his nose were just like two black dots in his face. He was wearing a sort of sheet or robe that was black and reached the floor. He had three fingers and a thumb on each hand. They were webbed. He didn't remember seeing any ears or mouth, but the creature spoke to him somehow. Stevens claimed that it was like a voice in his brain. It told him not to be afraid and that they were not going to hurt him. From there, he was led into another room
where four other similar looking creatures were waiting. It looked like an operating room to Stevens, who was told to get onto a long table which the creatures were standing around. They proceeded to take two needles of blood out of him, and then they requested he take off his clothes and lie down on the table. Stevens was resistant and tried to fight back. He even managed to punch one of the creatures. To his surprise, the creatures didn't do anything. The creature merely backed away and reiterated that they did not intend to harm him. He eventually complied and a square machine with lights and dials on it was brought over, one with a long extension arm with something on the end of it that Stephen likened to an x-ray probe. It was moved over every inch of his body. He remembered that clicking sound it made. They also took blood, clippings of his fingernails, and pieces of hair and put them into jars or tubes. A button from Stephen's jacket was also taken. They further injected him with a brownish substance that he assumed was a sedative. The next thing he recalled was being redressed and placed back inside his vehicle. His next conscious memory was waking up inside the car. During the session, Stephen would become agitated. He had tremors, his arms would shake, his head would shake, and he'd shift position in his chair as though he was very uncomfortable. At times, his answers were barely audible, while at other times, he failed to answer a question even though Dr. Hopkins would repeat it several times. When asked about whether or not the creatures had ears, Stevens became confused or upset. I think that is because he was inhibited by some means by these creatures, so he wouldn't reveal everything that went on, Dr. Hopkins said. It took a deep level of hypnosis to get anything out of him. He drew a picture that didn't have any ears, so apparently they didn't. But I don't know why David balked about that question. Stevens couldn't recall asking the creatures any questions. Hopkins suspected it had to do with his level of fright. For several days after the incident, Stevens and Gray were convinced that UFOs were following them, despite the few initial discussions. Gray refused to talk about what happened. Of the two, Gray appeared to be the most disturbed, and Stevens believed that his paranoia over what had happened so traumatized him that he eventually fled the state, since he wouldn't allow himself to be regressed. One can only wonder what nightmares things happened to him in that span of missing time. In January, Dr. Bertold Schwartz, a psychiatrist in Montclair, New Jersey, questioned Stevens and his family at length. There were nine other people living together in Stevens' household at the time, David and his parents, plus brothers and sisters, a brother-in-law, and a baby nephew. Dr. Schwartz spent eight and a half hours questioning them together and individually about the UFO incident. He believed that Stevens was telling the truth, and noted that aspects of the case were completely arresting. They weren't drunk or on drugs, and they weren't crazy. It was just a weird story that hung together no matter how many times they told it. David wanted to talk about his experience and get it out of his system, so to speak, whereas the other fellow, we all react differently in this world, shut the thing away and didn't want anything to do with it. He also noted that the event impacted the boys in extremely negative ways. Both men lost their jobs and became a laughing stock in their town once the story got around. Stevens, who managed to find another job, had almost constant bloodshot eyes. He remained perpetually tired and continued to be haunted by memories of that night and had nagging thoughts that he was still being watched. Schwartz was impressed by Hopkins' work with Stevens. While no tangible evidence of that night exists, it does appear that more than just Gray and Stevens saw odd flying phenomena that night. Over in Limestone, Aristotle County, Maine, the Loring Air Force Base was dealing with a strange object they initially thought to be a helicopter but turned out to be much larger. Over at Brunswick, Maine Naval Station, a soon-to-be Washington, D.C. paralegal named Robert Kinn watched, along with another student, as an object that he initially took to be a helicopter moved across the ocean and made strange 90-degree turns in the sky. As well, a policeman saw a UFO less than a dozen miles from where Stevens and Gray had their encounter. Lloyd Herrick, then 23, was out patrolling at around 1 a.m. when he drove out to Norway Lake west of town. He looked up into the night sky and saw something strange coming over the pines. I've never seen anything like it before. I stopped and got out of my cruiser and watched it. It was shaped like a short cigar and had two red lights on it, one in front and one in back. The middle part was black. It couldn't have been more than 800 feet above me. It wasn't going very fast, in fact, pretty slow. 
I must have watched it for at least a minute as it passed over Norway Lake and headed right into the direction of Norway. It must have passed right over town. I was so amazed by this thing. It made no sound. It wasn't a plane. He called the sheriff's office on his radio and asked the dispatcher if they had any UFO reports that evening. The dispatcher laughed and asked him if he had been drinking. Dr. Hopkins, a skeptic who never believed in or thought about UFOs, had a change of heart following his many sessions with Stevens. This was a unique experience for me. I was intrigued, he said. Over the two months, he had accumulated several hours of taped sessions with Stevens. On the evening of Saturday, September 11, 1976, Hopkins was at home alone when he received a call from someone claiming to be the Vice President of the New Jersey UFO Research Organization, asking if he could drop by and speak to Hopkins about the Stevens case. Hopkins found this odd, given that the case had occurred almost eight months prior, but for reasons he was later unable to identify, he agreed. He hung up the phone and went into the hallway to turn on the light and was startled to see that his visitor was already climbing the back steps and was nearly at his door. There was no way, not if the man had called from across the street, not if he had called from next door, that he could have possibly made it to Hopkins' door so quickly. This was 1976 and cell phones simply did not exist. Though extremely puzzled, Hopkins opened the door and invited the gentleman inside. Hopkins was immediately struck by the oddness of the visitor who entered and took a seat inside his living room. Firstly, his attire was in impeccable condition, entirely black, shoes, socks, pants, shirt, tie, jacket, and the round polished derby hat he wore. The other thing that bothered him was that the man was completely bald, meaning in addition to lacking hair on his head, he was also missing eyebrows and eyelashes. The man's skin was dead white, except for his lips, which were bright red. As well, his facial features were odd. His nose was disproportionately small and set low and far back. He had a receding chin, and instead of having a neck, his head appeared to meld with his shoulders. His eyes, though not glowing, were unusual in a way that Hopkins had difficulty describing in a mechanical voice completely devoid of intonation or inflection, the visitor explained his understandings of the Stevens case, which Hopkins confirmed as accurate. They continued to discuss the case with Hopkins doing most of the talking. He realized that the stranger seemed more interested in finding out what Hopkins knew about the case than actually learning anything about it for himself. Things grew gradually more bizarre with each passing minute. At one point, the stranger, who was wearing what appeared to be gray suede gloves, brushed his lips with the back of his hand. When he put his hand back down, his face and glove were smeared red. Hopkins examined the mouth more closely and quickly realized the thing had no lips, just a slit mouth doctored with lipstick to give the most general impression of lips. Further, Hopkins could discern no teeth in its mouth. Apparently satisfied with the information gathered from Hopkins, the visitor changed the subject, informing the doctor that there were two coins in Hopkins' pocket, which was correct, and asked him to remove one. Hopkins complied and held the coin, a shiny new penny, in the palm of his hand. Then the visitor told Hopkins to watch the coin closely. After a few minutes, it took on a silvery appearance and then appeared to be going out of focus and then began to fade and eventually disappeared altogether. The dark-suited stranger informed Hopkins that the coin would never be seen on this plane again. He then inquired as to whether Hopkins was familiar with the alleged UFO abductee, Barney Hill. Hopkins replied that he had heard of Hill, but was under the impression that he had died in the not-too-distant past. The stranger informed Hopkins that he was correct but added Barney didn't have a heart, just like you no longer have a coin. In a gentle but inherently threatening manner, the visitor suggested that Hopkins destroy any material he had related to the Stevens case. Hopkins noticed that the visitor's speech was slowing down considerably. He unsteadily rose to his feet and Hopkins saw him to the door. He watched him slowly descend the stairs, 
placing both feet on each step before attempting to negotiate the next one, he finally made it to the bottom and disappeared around the corner of the house from which a strange bright light emanated. Hopkins initially took the light to be from a stranger's vehicle, but he later realized that the light was far too bright and bluish to have come from an ordinary car headlights. Badly shaken and deeply confused, Hopkins wandered back inside. His dog, a normally fearless German Shepherd Collie mix, had run into the closet with its tail between its legs when the stranger first arrived and was still there, refusing to come out. Fearing that they might come back, Hopkins went and retrieved his revolver out of a dresser drawer and took a seat at his kitchen table where he sat racking his brain about what had just happened and what to do about it. It didn't take him long to decide what to do. He went into another room, gathered all the material from the Stevens case, demagnetized the tapes, cut them up into minuscule pieces, and then, for good measure, burned them all along with some other documents related to the case. When Hopkins' family returned home, they could see that he was obviously quite upset. Hopkins related his bizarre story, which prompted his teenage son to grab a flashlight and go out to the driveway to look for any evidence of the presence of a vehicle. In the darkness, he discovered caterpillar tractor-type markings in the sand that had blown onto the driveway during a recent storm. The markings were very deep and distinct, but were only about four inches wide and a foot and a half long. What is more, they were directly in the center of the narrow driveway where no conventional vehicle would leave a trace. Mysteriously, while the sand was still in the driveway, the following morning the driveway had not been used but the marks were gone. Not long after, Hopkins began experiencing trouble with his telephone. He often picked it up to find the line dead or filled with static and his patients began to complain that when they called he either didn't answer his phone or they would get a voice falsely claiming that his number was out of service. On those occasions when a connection was successfully made, it was often mysteriously broken in the middle of a conversation. The local phone company determined that Hopkins' phone line was definitely being tampered with, but were at a loss to explain how or by whom. On September 24, 1976, Less than two weeks after Hopkins' nighttime visit, his daughter-in-law, Maureen, received a strange phone call from a man claiming to be an acquaintance of her husband, John. The man asked if he and a friend could drop by the house, ostensibly for a social call. John, unable to place the man, but curious, agreed to meet him in a nearby restaurant. At the restaurant, John was confronted with a very strange-looking man and his even stranger-looking female companion both attired in odd-looking, old-fashioned clothes. John knew that he had never met this man before and realized that there was something inherently weird about them. He inexplicably invited them back to his home. Both individuals appeared to experience great difficulty in simply walking, taking rapid short steps while leaning impossibly forward. The woman's legs, judging from her particularly odd locomotion, appeared to be joined to her hips in a most peculiar manner. Once back in Hopkins' home, the two put on a bizarre display, one that John and Maureen felt, in hindsight, was intended to unnerve them. The man proceeded to ask John and Maureen rather personal questions, such as what they had read, talked about, or watched on TV. At one point, John left the room, and the strange man took the opportunity to invite Maureen to sit next to him on the couch. When Maureen declined, her female guest inquired as to how she was made and whether she had any nude photographs of herself available. Maureen became instantly frightened in their presence and sensed something sinister about the pair. When John returned to the room, the woman suddenly, albeit awkwardly, stood up and announced that it was time to go. The two lurched out the door together, one behind the other. Hopkins and his family's encounters with the strange men in black types is considered to be one of the most bizarre in all of UFO literature. One of the things that puzzled investigators was with regards to the Barney Hill questions. Hopkins had replied that he had heard that he had died in the not too distant past. At the time, Hopkins had assumed Hill had passed away due to a bad heart. In reality, Barney had died of a cerebral hemorrhage. However, the visitor's confirmation to him that Barney didn't have a heart 
speaks to not only the very sinister nature of the beings, but it also seems to suggest that he had possibly read Hopkins' mind. Interestingly, they weren't finished. Stephen also received a strange visit from an odd man dressed in black at his trailer not too long after. He too was warned to stay quiet about the UFO experience. In the end, one is left to wonder about the diabolical nature of the strange creatures that Gray and Stevens encountered on that desolate country road back in 1975. As well, what to make of Hopkins' strange visitor and his seeming ability to manipulate time and space and frighten the well-respected psychiatrist enough that he would burn his notes? Is it possible that Hopkins unveiled something in those sessions that Stevens' captors wanted kept quiet? Possibly. Regardless, the Grand Stevens abduction remains one of the most well-documented, frightening, and utterly baffling cases ever recorded.